Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, taking workshops and conferences online into a digital space and how to make that uh, actually good experience. Um, so, so today's session, I've got a couple of, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the things that we'll be doing. One is, I want us to take a bit of time to learn about some principles that can help you design engaging digital workshops, collaborations, conferences uh, in the online space. And two is we're going to take some time also to answer some of your questions about designing and facilitating digital workshops um, and all of these different kinds of experiences um, that you might be doing online. Uh, as Helen mentioned, feel free to use the chat even kind of as I'm speaking. Uh, I will try to check it as frequently as possible, but we're going to dedicate a good, I think, 20, you know, 25 minutes to Q&A as well so that we can get into some of your questions. So a little bit about me, uh, let's maybe I'll, I'll say a little bit to that. Um, so I support a number of different uh, organizations in the development space um, when it comes to innovation, but also when it comes to creating uh, digital workshops and digital experiences. I work with a, a company called Tendemic. I know it's it's a little unbelievable, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we, we named it 10 years ago. And uh, it's a combination of tandem working together and a pandemic, of course, something that grows uh, exponentially. And part of, you know, what I'll be covering here are, are learnings uh, that I've kind of uh, developed over a number of years of I'm actually teaching at the D school at Stanford, a class entirely about uh, taking design thinking, taking human centered design, which is something that's very kind of analog, people posting it, putting up post-its on walls um, into a digital space. And, and, and what are some of the workflows and approaches and then developing that more into digital workshops and experiences. So that is a little bit about me now. Many of you, uh, if you're interested in kind of hosting a digital workshop, um, you're acting as facilitators, right? And as facilitators, we work with a group of people that is trying to go somewhere and there's usually a gap, right? There's something that makes it hard for that group to go somewhere. Maybe they don't have a lot of time to, to make the decisions that they need to make to go there. Uh, maybe they're not quite sure uh, where they're looking to, where exactly they want to end up. And so as facilitators, what we all do is we try to provide some kind of process uh, uh, to help them get over that gap or, or, or get from point A to point B. Now, the trouble is that as we've, you know, taken, you know, so many of our workshops and, and uh, you know, digital experiences meetings uh, into the digital space, um, what you've, what we've, many of us have found is that many digital uh, workshops are terrible, right? And it used to be that when I started this kind of conversation, uh, I had to talk a little bit about, you know, <laughs> why it's actually going to be important to be able to run good digital workshops. COVID is with us for a while. I don't think we need to make that argument anymore. It's very clear in the, in the development space, in the, um, but also you know, in the government space where so much work is done through meetings, so much work is done through workshops and conferences that, that now we actually have to, to seriously think about um, how we're going to do these um, in a digital way, um, how we're gonna do them effectively in a digital way. And that's a particular set of skills that we're gonna be talking about today. Now. I have a list of uh, the biggest uh, digital workshop sins, right, for me. These are the things that I see, and when I see them in a digital workshop or in a meeting, meeting they piss me off, right? So, so one, let me tell you about mine, and I wanna hear about yours in the chat in a moment. So, so one is, uh, uh, you know, workshops where a facilitator goes in and frames a discussion around a vague or abstract question, right? How would you define sustainability? Right, uh, you know, it's like really, what kind of discussion are we going to have about that? Right, uh, uh, vague or, or abstract questions, uh, I just find are, are, are a recipe for not having great conversations in a digital space. Number two is the training the audience to become passive. Right, so if you're talking, you know, or if, if your if your facilitator is talking for the first 20 minutes uh, without any audience interaction, essentially you're just telling the audience, guys, sit back. Uh, you know, we're not going to be interacting with you. Uh, you can go and answer your emails or whatever. Whatever it is that you like to do while you sit in these things right at the beginning of the of, of the engagement that's where you're essentially training your audience to, to understand what kind of interaction they can expect from you and my third uh, sort of biggest uh, digital workshop sins is doing a workshop without having reverse the tech rehearse the technology right so so without having tested some of the different things around around that but I want to hear let me open up the chat I want to hear from you folks uh, what are some of your what are the biggest digital workshop sins, as the biggest, not necessarily biggest sins in general, but you know, bi biggest digital workshop sins that you have seen, or it could be meetings, it could be digital conferences as well. Let's take a moment to, to put those into the chat. Death by PowerPoint, says Ian. Absolutely. 
not stopping when we said we would uh, by, that's Amelia, thanks. Silence, oh, the awkward silences on the internet are so much longer. Not following time, technical difficulties. Yeah, you, I mean, I, I've seen many uh, kind of uh, sessions be completely paralyzed by someone who's like, ah, oh, my video's not working, my audio's not working. Not giving, uh, so people not keep staying muted. Just one person speaking the whole time, right? So what, you know, you've you've brought a, a workshop together. Ostensibly, it's about the participants, but for some reason, it becomes about one person. Not giving people enough time to think or respond. I love that, Lucy. Thank you for that. Having dozens of people speak in two minutes—the opposite of having one person speaking. Unclear instructions for breakout rooms, right? You land up in a breakout room and you're like, "Hey, what was it we were supposed to do again?" <laughs> Ali Reza, assuming that because there is no conference room time limit, the session can go on forever. Wow, that sounds like a that sounds like a horror movie waiting to be made. Trying to have a voice in a conversation when the group is too big, right? So 20, you know, trying to have a conversation 20, 30 people is impossible. And Linda says, letting people leave their video on while they're doing other things. Oh yes. I have heard many or many a horror story about that. Okay, these are great ones. <laughs> thanks for thanks so much for sharing. So for for me, you know, these are these are absolutely um, excellent uh, examples of what are some of the things we don't want to have happen in digital workshops. Now, what I would say is the biggest sin of them all, the meta sin, if if you will, um, is the idea that you can take an in person training experience, a workshop, a meeting, a conference, whatever, and then do all of the things that you were going to do in person in a digital space, right? And I see so many uh, different events or programs that that try to do that, right? So, and I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, I had a discussion um, some time ago with a development bank and they launched products uh, uh, and the way that they would launch products uh, before COVID uh, is they would gather a whole bunch of their staff in, a, uh, in an auditorium. Um, they'd have someone present and then they have a panel of, of kind of senior leadership, um, give some thoughts or feedback on it. And, and you know, what this person told me is we, we do these launch events and people leave the room feeling energized. They, they have this experience with a whole number of other people. Um, they're excited about a new product that the, that the bank is offering. Uh, fantastic, right? Now you can imagine that if you took uh, that that exact formula. So we do a Zoom, but you took it into the digital space. So we do a Zoom call, people attend, someone gives a presentation, uh, a number of people respond. That, that does not at all have the same emotional value, right? And, and so I think, you know, one of the first things to, to that I work with um, uh, when I work with uh, people who are trying to take a, a digital workshop or a conference online is to, is to really just take a step back and realize there's no direct, good direct translation um, of a digital, uh, of, a, of an in-person experience into a digital space. But what I found is that, you know, over the past few years is that the good news is that well-designed online workshops can actually be better than face-to-face -face workshops. And, and the key to, to coming, coming to this uh, realization is when we stop thinking about digital workshops as being second class to in-person face-to-face workshops, and when we start thinking about what are some of the things that we can do in a digital space that we can't do in person, right? There's so much thinking about, you know, what's harder, what we can't do in a digital space versus in person, but what about all of the things that we can do in a digital space that we cannot do in an in-person workshop? And I'm gonna give you uh, a few examples. So in terms of what's different when we take a, a workshop or a meeting, a conference online. Number one, is I find that it's actually a lot easier to have more structured conversations in digital workshops. When you design a digital workshop around a canvas um, or, or some kind of framework that participants are looking at while they're having the conversation, it, it becomes a lot easier to actually make sure that the conversation is following some kind of track and we're getting from A to B. Number two is in the digital space, you can actually enable a slower cadence of work. So it used to be that when we ran a workshop in another country or, or somewhere anyway, we'd have to fly a bunch of people in and, uh, you know, because it's expensive, uh, because we have to rent a hotel, all of these things, uh, we have to cram everything into two, three days, right? Now, in a digital space, what we've taken to doing is saying, well, you know, we're going to we're gonna take this and we're gonna split it into one and a half hour sessions. And that changes the dynamic of, of what you can do uh, and it changes the possibilities of what you can do. So, you know, for example, if it's a program where people are coming up with ideas uh, that they'd like to implement in their government agency or whatever it might be, you know, 
there is now space for you to take some of those ideas and start uh, socializing them with some of your colleagues or get feedback from different stakeholders before you come into the next session. When you, cram when you try to cram the whole workshop in three days, that just wasn't possible. And what it means is actually you can get higher quality results um, when you space it out like that, which is something that is much harder to do for in-person workshops. And then the last piece I'll mention is for all of you folks who are, are facilitating uh, in-person workshops or have done in-person workshops, uh, no more, uh, uh, no more trying to take photos of flip charts, you know, with half-completed sentences and, and figuring out after the fact what happened. Uh, because we're working in a digital uh, a space with uh, frameworks, you're actually going to end up with well-documented and actionable outputs, or, or more well-documented and actionable outputs. So for me, those are three kinds of things that are different. Let's talk a little bit about um, what are some use cases. So how are we using, uh, how are we creating digital workshops in an online space? Um, one thing that I've, uh, I'm working with a number of uh, country offices at, uh, in fact, regions at UNDP is around doing collaborative future mapping. So this is a series of kind of three workshops uh, that are about one and a half hours. And we start off by kind of thinking about, okay, well, what, uh, what is our, our sensor network um, for signals of change in our countries, right? Where are we going to go and find um, signals that, that things are changing and how things are changing in the country? And then uh, we talk a little bit about that we map our sensor networks and then everyone goes off and they go in and look for some of the signals of change that they're finding in their countries and then we come back for the second workshop and what, what we'll do is we'll map those signals of change against a, a wheel like this one right where we're looking at you know what are some of the emerging signals around technology environment the economy you know politics, so on and so forth, but also what are some of those strong signals of change? And then we start, start drawing out in the third workshop some of the implications around that, right? And this is, this is an activity that we can do across countries in real time. It's a lot of fun to do. Um, and it's certainly, because it's broken into one and a half workshops, it's much higher quality activity than you would get if you were doing, say, a foresight workshop, you know, in, in two days or, or, or something like that. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so, you know, if, uh, at the early days of, of COVID, um, we brought 80 people together uh, to map out uh, what were the responses uh, that countries uh, were having to the COVID uh, crisis and uh, how ready those countries were. Uh, uh, and so that's kind of this graph that you see on the, on the left side, you know, how strong is the response? Is a complete lockdown? Is it about doing absolutely nothing? How ready is the country, you know, um, in terms of its social safety net, so on and so forth. And then uh, trying to understand it and to map together um, what are some of the different responses that we're seeing in, in countries from people, from businesses, from CSOs, so on and so forth. And, and pulling out, you know, what are some of the opportunities there? Now, normally, this was an hour long session. Normally, you would never run an hour long workshop with 80 people uh, from, you know, so many different countries. But because we're doing it in a digital space, because we're all collaborating in a, a kind of well structured uh, environment, a board like this one, um, it actually becomes possible and becomes even far more productive than, than it would be um, if you're trying to do it uh, uh, as an in person workshop. But we also do this with senior government officials. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, you know, just to give you a sense of, of the different audiences that you can do this with, a couple of weeks ago, um, one of the things I helped uh, run was uh, this Next Gen Gov conference um, in Asia Pacific. And uh, we, we had, you know, a senator, we had deputy ministers, so on and so forth. And this was initially intended as a two-day conference. And what we've now done is we've actually turned it into a six-month journey where it's about working with these uh, uh, senior government officials to do things like reimagine re what their ministry of planning will be post COVID or, you know, uh, uh, social safety nets and, and how those need to be um, rethought uh, uh, post COVID. The last thing I'll just say about uh, use cases is, you know, some people think doubt that it's possible to have um, deep and meaningful conversations uh, in a digital space. And, you know, I'll, I'll just mention this from our, our Design Across Borders class. So traditionally, you know, for, for the last few years, Design Across Borders has really been about the, the more, um, I would say, technique of, of taking, you know, so, something like human-centered design, design thinking, designing, doing design research, pro designing products and services collaboratively in a digital space. This year, uh, we decided to, uh, we decided that the additional border that we would look at is a political border, given the, the current situation that we're in, uh, uh, you know, not just, you know, in, in the United States, but, but uh, globally. And, um, and, and, and the, what we focused on was helping people who were um, anti-Trump, 
uh, gain a deeper understanding of, of why people who are Trump supporters are Trump supporters. And, and we had a group of students from the Philippines as well. So helping anti-Duterte uh, people understand, you know, understand why, how Duterte supporters think, get a, gain a deeper understanding of them. And, um, and it's been a, a tremendously, I think, meaningful um, and, and, and deep experience um, for many of those people as we looked at tackling uh, not just the digital borders, um, but also political um, and, and just deep differences um, in worldview and, and working on, on bridging those. So, so that's a little bit about, you know, some of the possibilities around digital workshops and, and digital experiences. Now I want to ask you, you folks, a question, uh, which is around what is the best setup for collaboration? And, and I want you to, to you know, set, let's set aside COVID right now. So let's, you know, let's say in the absence of COVID, uh, uh, which of these setups is the best? Now, I'll, I'll walk you through what each of these setups is. Um, so a connected setup is where you've got two rooms with two groups of people and uh, they're connected using video conferencing. And, and uh, so that's you know, our first connected setup. Then you've got a mixed setup where you've got one room uh, with a number of people inside that room, but you've also got people who are, who are dialed in. And then you've got the distributed setup, which is what we're doing now. Everyone is uh, kind of connecting online. There's no one in a room uh, that's central uh, as part of this session. Now, uh, if, you, if you plan on telling me, it depends, I wanna hear what it depends on. Uh, 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 otherwise, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take your answers. So I've got, I see a couple of distributed here. Uh, uh, keep, keep your answers coming in the chat. Distributed, that's Carolyn. So let me, Sadia, um, you said distributed. Do you want to tell us a little bit about why you think distributed? Are people able, uh, Helen, are people able to unmute I, themselves? I've just invited Sadia to speak. Uh, oh, okay. so I've asked her to unmute. Sadia, um, you should have a notification and if you click yes, exactly, go ahead, we can hear you shortly. Tell us. Sadia, you're unmuted. If you don't want to speak, that's fine too. Okay, let's, let's ask a couple more people. Vlada says mixed. Vlada, I'd love to hear why mixed. Again, Vlada, you're unmuted. Well, you're not having any luck, today. It's a shy audience. <laughs> somehow, somehow we've stripped them of their voice. Um, all right, let's take, let's just take a look at what's in the chat. So, so Jurgen says, uh, mix may be good if you've got a panel of experts and a separate audience. Um, Sadia, uh, Sadia, okay, Sadia explained in the chat. Um, it gives us more opportunities to exchange. And so Sadia, you had said distributed. Okay, great. Uh, we've got, uh, depending on context, says Suzyner. So Suzyner, I would love to hear what you think it depends on, right? So what's the context where you think, let, you know, one, one of these options might be better? And Susanna should be able to speak now again. Let's try if that's um, lucky. Okay, um, basically Hi. it depends on what's the outcome that you're looking to get. Um, some, and depending on the audience and the participants that you're working with, sometimes the mixed model would work better. Some would prefer distributed models where they can collaborate on a smaller group. So it really depends on the context of what you're looking at. Okay, just out of curiosity, where are you from? I'm from Malaysia. I thought I heard a Malaysian accent. Uh, I, I live in Malaysia normally. Uh, okay, uh, so it, it depends. Let's see. Margaret says, uh, for the events I have run and will run distributed, there are many events that are other types of, uh, better distributed. Okay, so we've got a lot of distributed here. We've got a couple of other things uh, uh, in, in here, but uh, many people saying distributed. And, and before I give my answer on this, um, I'm, I'm going to preface it by saying this is not written in stone, right? So there are different contexts and where you're going to find that, you know, for one reason or another, one of these things could be better. So there's no absolute answer to this, but uh, uh, there are certainly answers that I lean towards. And what I'm going to start with is actually uh, which of these setups I think is the worst. Uh, so I think mixed is, is actually often the worst because uh, what happens is when you have people who are in a room together, it's very easy for them to have a quick back and forth, right? And, and you know, before you know it, someone gets up uh, with a, a marker and starts writing on a whiteboard and the people who are dialed in, uh, you know, can't, can't 
actually see what's up there. It's very hard for them to kind of insert themselves in the conversation. You're really a second class participant um, if you're in a mixed um, sort of environment and you're trying to do a collaboration, right? So, so I'm focusing really here on, on collaborations uh, between people. Connected uh, can be a good option if your participants have limited bandwidth, for example, and they might need to use your facilities. But many times bandwidth uh, connected has the same challenges as a mixed environment does because you might have a room that's bigger than another where most of the conversation happens or where the leadership team is and and that's where all of the action is right and so so essentially you have a whole group of people in the other room that find it much more difficult to get into that conversation that mixed setup really puts people um, on an equal footing and I also find that you know and this is one of the kind of um, maybe unintended effects of, of going into digital space, but I also find that the distributed setup um, has the added advantage of uh, flattening the hierarchy a little bit as well. There's no head of table, right? Uh, um, and so, so I, I love the distributed setup. I certainly recommend it. Um, in, in, in you know where where it's possible, where people have the bandwidth and the equipment to do it, it will lead to a much better collaboration experience. So let's get into kind of six principles uh, for designing digital engagements. And these are six principles that I've kind of developed uh, uh, over the years, uh, designing digital workshops, collaborations, so on and so forth, uh, distilled, you know, uh, ideas distilled into these six uh, principles for digital engagements. Now, if you have questions uh, or, or comments or thoughts or whatever it is, go ahead and, and add them into the chat. Uh, we are going to get to them. We're going to spend, uh, I think, a decent amount of time um, in our conversation today uh, in Q&A. Now, the first one is to make it a human experience. Uh, and I really, you know, whenever I go into a workshop or a meeting or something like that, I really try to get everyone to turn out on their cameras. Uh, I think that there's, there's nothing worse uh, speaking into the void uh, for participants, just as much for the facilitator, and, and, and not really knowing whether the people, you know, who are in that conversation are paying attention or they're even, you know, behind their computer. Uh, um, so I, for me, you know, not having your camera on is, is a bad habit, uh, although I acknowledge that, oh, thank you, uh, <laughs> I acknowledge that, um, it, you know, one of the one of the challenges is that not everyone has the bandwidth to do this, right? So, so I appreciate that actually it's not always possible to have uh, uh, to have your camera on. But where you're in a meeting where multiple people are supposed to be interacting, I encourage you know people to turn on their cameras to be able to see the person uh, on the other side and make it a human experience. The other piece is to use breakout rooms. So if you are using a uh, piece of software uh, like Zoom, uh, but you can also do this in certain other pieces of software, is to take a, a group and break it into smaller groups uh, and where they can have their own smaller conversations, right? Once a group starts getting beyond you know, eight, nine people, it actually becomes very, very hard for people to have a conversation. You end up with a dynamic where, you know, a bunch of people are taking the back seat and they're not really participating and a bunch of people um, are in the front seat. So, so I absolutely love breakout rooms. What it does is it takes a conversation and, and brings it to human kind of scale where, where it's actually possible to have that conversation. Second design principle um, is to go beyond the agenda to the process. So oftentimes when we design workshops, um, uh, you know, what, what happens is uh, I'll see kind of big blocks of time get dedicated. So we're going to spend an hour talking about this, and then we're going to spend an hour and a half talking about this, so on and so forth. You cannot do this in the digital space. Uh, uh, just people don't have the attention spans uh, for it. Um, and so what we need to do in a digital space is actually to take that one hour and to say, okay, where are people going to be at the beginning of that hour? And where do we want them to be at the end of that one hour? And how do we design a process, a series of uh, micro activities that are five or 10 minutes long to get people to the place where we want them to be at the end of that hour, right? So, so every five or 10 minutes, you're switching views, you're switching speakers, you're switching activities, but you're, you're, you're kind of varying it a little um, so that uh, uh, you're keeping people's attention and you're keeping them engaged, but you're also thinking about the process, right? Where do we want to be at the beginning? Where do we want to be um, at the end? So let's, you know, let's take a little look at how that, that can happen. When I think about digital workshops, I think about five different modes uh, of work for digital workshops. So, so these are almost like your ingredients. 
Now, one mode is the share up. That's what I, that's what we're doing right now. So I'm speaking. You folks are are listening. But you could also have a facilitated conversation, right? So Justin, what did you think about that? And, and Gopal, what did you think about what Justin said? And then so you know so on and so forth. We bounce the conversation um, off uh, uh, different people, right? You could also have a silent collaboration. So silent collaboration is is where you might have a number of people who are working on something together. They're on the line together, but they're silent, right? So so maybe we're all filling out a Google Doc with some different ideas, or or we're filling out a mural board um, and adding some post-its to it and we're doing it uh, quietly right then you have out loud collaboration which is we're all working on something together but we're having a discussion around that thing and the last mode um, of work for a digital workshop is asynchronous so that's where we might go off and we might do things together but uh, sorry we might do things separately uh, but we uh, come back uh, together and, and, and put them into a, some kind of shared um, space. So what does that look like when you actually uh, design a, a workshop or a session? Well, let's say that we were designing a workshop to, uh, we were running a workshop to design more engaging digital, digital workshops, a little meta, right? But we're, we're running a workshop to design more engaging digital workshops. So how I might do this is I might start with asynchronous. Uh, I tell everyone, okay, folks, go and uh, spend two days and do research. I want you to find highly interactive online experiences, ex online experiences that you thought uh, you loved, and then put them into a, a shared board. And then when we actually start the conversation, maybe we'll start with a share out. So I'll get everyone to share their inspirations, right? Uh, 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 share, uh, you know, what you felt uh, was uh, most interesting about the experience you found. Uh, we take two minutes per person to do that. And then maybe we do a silent collaboration. So having seen all of these different uh, inspirations, the different examples, um, let's brainstorm some ideas. Let's write down as many ideas as you can about how to improve digital workshops. And, and then we'll vote for the most uh, implementable one. So maybe we spend 10 minutes writing them down silently uh, and then three minutes um, actually uh, voting for uh, some of the most interesting ones. Um, and then we might go into out loud collaboration, right? So we might say, okay, let's talk a little bit about how we might combine some of our top voted um, ideas uh, uh, and, and uh, discuss uh, those and then, and then finally vote. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, right? So that could be um, an example of how you might design a session with these ingredients. Now, oftentimes uh, these ingredients will fall into a bigger kind of arc for a workshop or um, some kind of experience that you're having, right? Which I, I think about uh, in three acts. So the first act is to build a common understanding, right? You can't bring people in and, and suddenly, you know, brainstorm solutions if people don't even have a common understanding of what the problem is, right, in the first place or, or why, you know, we're tackling this, this problem. So that's the opening, right? We want to build some kind of common understanding. And the second act is, is of a digital workshop is kind of shaping some choices, right? So let's put up some options on the table uh, um, and uh, uh, let's figure out, you know, what are some of the possibilities? And the third act is, is converging. So to, to make some uh, decisions and to really think about um, how we might move forward. I'm going to pause here. Let me have a quick look at the chat. Uh, let's see what are some of the questions. You want so, some help, Carol? So some... I've been monitoring them. Yeah, sure. So uh, there's some really good questions coming in from uh, Lucy on hybrid meetings. And she's saying mm. once we come back to the office, some people will be in the office, others will be remote. Um, what's your recommendation there to not, make, not put people at a disadvantage? Um, and she specifically says conference room equipment and setup putting the remote participants at a disadvantage. So any thoughts on hybrid? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I only use hybrid in very specific circumstances. So if if you're thinking about a, a mixed setup, um, I think in the in Lucy in the way that you're you're talking about, I would actually advocate for everyone to come uh, in a distributed format, right? So so either everyone is in the room at the same time together or everyone is distributed, but try not to do uh, the, the hybrid format. I just think it, it creates a bad experience for um, the people who are, who are not there. So um, I, I would, I would um, discourage it. I have done hybrid workshops um, in some cases. So uh, a few, uh, what was it, last month, um, I, I did a workshop with four uh, provinces in Mongolia and, and it was a hybrid workshop uh, but the reason that we did it as a hybrid workshop is we actually had local facilitators in each of the 
um, in each of the provinces, right? So the, the setup there was um, I, would ex I would walk through a series of activities um, and then I had pre-trained facilitators on the ground to run through those activities on the ground. And then we would do feedback sessions together. Um, and uh, in each of those provinces were all were connected um, in, from a different location. So um, they were even watching each other's kind of share outs uh, uh, in a digital format. But that would be that would be a good use case, I think, of hybrid. Anything else? Let's take one more question, Johanna. Let's take one more question. Um, I think we're going to get to participant engagement later on in the webinar. So okay. I don't want to I don't want to take that one yet. Um, right. But Ian was also asking Ian Thorpe from UNICEF, wondering if you can insist on all online meetings. So if you have ever sent people to different rooms while they were in the same building so that everyone is online. Yes, I absolutely yeah. have. Yeah, I have. And, and I think everyone has, I think many people have had that, you know, kind of crappy experience of, uh, of being the person not, you know, on the, not in the room. And, 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 I, and so I think people understand the why behind it. Um, uh, so so I, I think it's a good norm to establish around uh, meetings. So far, I haven't run into cases where people have pushed back. Excellent. Okay. All right, let's, let's keep on uh, going with our principles for designing uh, digital workshops. So the next one is, is to leverage multitasking productively, right? And so the truth is that, you know, while you're running your conference calls and your online meetings, people are eating ice cream and they're clipping their toenails and they're, uh, you know, who knows, watching Netflix uh, uh, and the question or answering their emails. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, people are going to multitask anyway, right, in a, a, when they're in a digital workshop. And the question I have for you is, are they multitasking on what you're working on together or are they multitasking on something different? And if their attention is divided, then you're not going to get quality contributions from them. And uh, uh, you're, you're just going to have sort of conversations where people are, are kind of trying to answer questions that they haven't really thought about deeply. Um, so what we want to do when we design digital workshops is we want to actually saturate the person that we're working with by making sure that they're not just interacting over video and audio, but that they're also doing something together. They're looking at something together. So for example, this is, um, this is a workshop where a group of people is mapping the user experience for, for bike rental, the user journey uh, around bike rental, and they're mapping out, you know, what are some of the pain points? What are some of the, the things that, you know, uh, uh, worked really well, so on and so forth. And so in this workshop, there's a discussion where, where, you know, people are talking together, but they're also working on something together. And you can imagine that if you're doing this kind of activity together, it's not possible for you to go watch a movie on the side or, or start answering your emails or, or so on and so forth. Well, certainly it's a lot harder uh, uh, to do, right? And, and uh, and, and so here, here's another example, you know, from one of our workshops. Uh, and so this is a this is someone who's you know doing a stakeholder mapping exercise, but you can also see they've got their phone on the side, and, and that's where they're participating uh, in the call and, and having that conversation at the same time. So the real question is is kind of you know what are you getting participants to work on together? What kind of interface are you using to do that? Um, and of course, I love to use Mural uh, um, as, a, as a tool and Miro as well. Um, I, I know that sometimes the, OICT, the office, ICT office is not so friendly to that. But what I found is actually um, a lot of people who, who thought pre-COVID that they would never be able to get some of these tools are finding that actually now it's a lot more possible to do, to, to, to get into collaboration tools. But you can also use you know, PowerPoint, you know, Office 365, you can edit things online simultaneously or Google Slides, uh, uh, and Google Jamboard. These are all, you know, some of these tools are, are very simple tools that you can use um, to get participants to work on something together, uh, not just to be talking uh, across. Next design principle is to call on people. So someone said earlier, uh, you know, in our in our greatest sins of digital workshop silence, right? And uh, uh, sometimes what I see facilitators do in digital workshops is, um, you know, they'll pose a question to the group, but they won't identify a person to answer that question, right? So uh, it would be kind of like, okay, who's got feedback on this? Silence. Right. And, and at the beginning of a workshop, if people don't haven't kind of gotten a feel of the dynamic in the session, who's going to step up to speak? Right. Uh, it's going to be maybe your super extrovert that's going to step up to speak if anyone speaks. Or maybe you'll get silence for a while and then three different people will start trying to talk at the same time. So I really advocate and 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 and. Um, uh, and uh, 
I really advocate setting as a standard or creating a norm in your workshops that you're actually going to call on people. You're going to ask specific people, you know, Bob, what did you think about this or, or Janet? Um, um, I'd love to hear, you know, what was something that surprised you in, in you know, the conversation that we just had? Um, I think calling on people really changes the level of interaction and it's actually something very, very easy to do. My second last design principle is to design for all three layers of the experience. So as uh, facilitators, as people who design workshops or conferences, we often spend a lot of time thinking about the official workshop. That's the agenda, the, the, you know, what goes into the uh, invitation and so on and so forth. But if you ask participants that participated, that took part in a conference or a program or, or a, a workshop that you ran in person before, what they found so valuable, they'll probably tell you a lot of things that are actually not on the official agenda, right? Um, I went to this conference and, uh, you know, it was, I, it was really useful because I built up uh, relationships with these different um, government officials that I normally wouldn't, you know, I normally wouldn't be able to get in touch with, right? Um, or, you know, someone who ran, uh, who runs a conference where, um, there's a multi-stakeholder conference where a, a bunch of NGOs get together on the side and, and they come up with a statement and make that statement, you know, who's telling me, how, how do we do that in a digital space? And the truth is that when you design these experiences in a digital space, everything that you do has to be intentional, right? Uh, uh, there, is, there isn't that space for spontaneity um, that you might have in an in-person uh, program or a workshop. And so if it's about NGOs getting together on the side, well, you better design that in, right? Or, or if it's about building those relationships, then you wanna make sure that you find ways to actually design ways for people to connect, um, you know, not just as they're doing exercises, but more on a personal level um, through the workshop. And then the last level is that emotional experience. So in many cases, you know, whether it's, uh, you're, you're trying to get people to commit to something at the end of a workshop, right? That's, that's a, an emotional experience that you're trying to create. Are they feeling confident about the solutions that they've come up with in this workshop? If you're, um, if you're trying to get a group that um, doesn't get along very well together to, to feel safe in this environment, that's part of the emotional experience as well. And so the, the, the third layer is to really think about actually how are you designing for, how, how are you creating that emotional experience in the workshop? You know, so you don't end up in a situation where, you know, like that development bank I talked about at the beginning runs their launch event uh, the same way they did in person in a digital space. And it just doesn't have that um, same emotional value uh, and kick to it. Now, the last uh, principle around uh, digital facilitation that I'll mention is if your program, if your workshop, if you're needing needed uh, facilitation in person, it'll need even more facilitation online. And, and there are a couple of reasons for this. One is simple, is if you're breaking down what your, your program was into these small five or 10 minute chunks, then it's so much more work to put together and to run, right? Um, another reason is that when you put people out into breakout rooms, um, you know, we, all, we haven't quite figured out what are the social norms for these things, right? And so there's always a silence at the beginning when you put people into breakout rooms. And, uh, and, and so you, you may need more facilitators, you know, to kind of run that type of experience, or at least you'll need prov to provide more scaffolding uh, for those conversations. So uh, uh, that's the last thing I'll say, even, oh, and I'll actually mention one more piece around this, which is the, the digital side, right? So um, just like how, you know, when you run a, a program in a hotel, you have someone who's taking care of the chairs and the, maybe the lighting and the IT, so on and so forth. You need that in the digital space as well, because there are, you know, different technical things that, that need to be done. Even sort of as we're having this conversation here, um, uh, Johanna and, and Helen um, have, have, you know, made sure that there are a number of settings uh, that are set. Uh, they're helping unmute people, or at least they're making sure that people are muted uh, so that, you know, we, we don't get these distractions as we're running um, this session, right? So uh, these are the six uh, principles around designing di digital workshops and, and collaborations. Make it a human experience. Go beyond the agenda to the process that people are going through. What are the steps that people are going through um, as they're going through your experience? Leverage multitasking productively. People are going to be multitasking, but is it going to be on what you're working with them on? Call on people, um, design for all three layers of that workshop experience, not just the official agenda, but the unofficial agenda and the emotional experience. And finally, if it needed a facilitator in person, um, it'll need even more facilitation on